okay. Thanks, thanks for coming to the third talk in this uh, sequence. So today we'll finally get to do, uh, see some more interesting mathematics, although since we're out of time, we won't uh, really get to see any proofs or anything. But I can allude to the mathematics. Okay, so uh, how do we end our last talk? We ended by uh, coming up with some methodology by which the sort of standard recipe by which one can prove uh, strong or optimal in approximability results. So here's the theorem that I kind of outlined the proof of last time. I put theorem in quotes since it's quite vaguely stated, but to state it very carefully is painful. Uh, so the whole theorem rests on this unique games conjecture, although as I mentioned last time there's a variant of this theorem that holds without assuming the unique games conjecture, but it's more complicated again. Uh, so the idea is, suppose you fix your favorite problem uh, that you care about approximability of, say an optimization problem like max cut, or max uh, uh, three linear equations, or max sat, or any such problem. Uh, to prove uh, some C versus S, actually there's some small deltas in here, but essentially C versus S in approximability, uh, it concises to construct a so-called gadget instance of the problem that satisfies some properties. Just to remind you, what this means is uh, such a statement says that there is no efficient algorithm with the following property on max blah inputs with optimum value at least C. The algorithm is guaranteed to find a solution with value at least S. Okay, so such a statement gets stronger and stronger, shows stronger and stronger hardness the further apart C and S are. Okay, so uh, what does your task reduce to? Well, it, as I said, it involves constructing a, a gadget instance, which will eventually plug into a, a polynomial time reduction, which has some properties. So let's go through them. The first property is that somehow the variables or vertex, vertices or the ground set in your optimization problem is identified with uh, zero, one to the R, where R you should think of as a very, very large uh, number, even infinity. Um, the property two is that the optimum, the best solution to this particular instance should have value C, the C that you're aiming for. Um, but not just that, uh, in fact there should be R optimal solutions, all of which achieve C, and they should somehow correspond to the coordinate sets, the subsets of the or functions on this, on this domain that are just depend on one coordinate. Okay, we saw this last time in the, the max K cover example. Uh, those are the two fairly well uh, put uh, statements. These ones are vaguer. So um, you also need some sort of scheme which takes any solution at all, not an optimal one, just any solution to your optimization problem, your instance of max blah, and sort of decodes it or naturally maps it into a constant size set of coordinates. Uh, or you may think of it as a constant size set of optimal solutions. So some, every function should be decodable or naturally mapped into at most a constant number of uh, solutions, uh, possibly zero. And the final uh, fact that you need is that if you have a solution that does not suggest or decode to any uh, coordinates, so somehow if you have a solution that is in some sense not at all like one of the optimal solutions, it's not at all like a coordinate solution, then its value should be much smaller than the optimal, it should be at most S the S you're shooting for here. And again, there's some plus little of one of delta. Okay, so once you have a gadget with these, uh, these properties, you can sort of plug it into a proof along the lines of the one I did last talk and actually get the hardness result. So today we'll see two examples of that for the three lin and max cut problems. And we'll just construct a gadget and analyze the gadget and then say that by plugging into this, we get the appropriate actual hardness results. So, uh, the first such result I'll prove is uh, about the three lin problem. And it says that for all positive delta, uh, max three lin, I'll remind you what this problem is in a second, is uh, one minus delta versus half plus delta in approximable. Assuming the unique games conjecture. And in fact, uh, this is even true without assuming the unique games conjecture. Uh, just assuming, or just assuming, p does not equal np. And this latter fact is due to Hostad in, I guess, uh, 98. 
okay? Uh, but we'll just prove it assuming the UGC and uh, I'll assure you that actually it's unconditional or just conditional on P does not equal NP uh, because we're going to use this methodology. Hosta did this methodology but he did the thing where you construct sort of an even more complicated gadget which is enough to get hardness assuming just uh, the hardness of label cover or max projection. And the unique games conjecture was made at that point. That is true. The unique games conjecture was not made at that point. Uh, okay. So, uh, let me recall what max 3 lin is. I defined it in the first uh, talk, but we'll see it again. Uh, so the input is a list of uh, equations that looks like, they each, each one looks like x, sorry, let me write uh, v. vi plus vj plus vk equals either zero or one mod two. Okay, so these are equations over Z to the abelian group of size two. Uh, and these VIs are the, in the variables. Okay, so VI here, VJ and VK are variables in some variable set V, which is implicit to the problem. And uh, what is the output? Actually, there's this terrible thing done in um, math where, you know, the names of the variables here are like vi and vj, and then you have a solution or a potential solution to the equations where what is the value of vi? You also denote it, do, uh, notate it by vi, which is terrible. You can't distinguish between the variable and the number you're assigning to it. So let's make the assignment explicit and say that uh, we're looking for some assignment f, which maps the variable set into either zero or one. And uh, because of this, I would actually prefer to write the equations like this, f of vi plus f of vj plus f of vk equals zero or one mod two. Okay, so the vi's are variables and the f's are assignments. You're trying to find assignments to the variables um, that satisfies as many of the equations as you can. So let me say that again. Your goal is to find uh, f to maximize the fraction of satisfied equations. Okay, that's clear. So um, these are all just symbols in the input. Okay, uh, let me actually put a little twist on this. Uh, I'm gonna make the problem, the, the algorithms problem here, it's very, very slightly more complicated. I put a tweak. Well, actually, uh, to each equation, I want to also associate a weight. So input also has a weight. Which I'll call P sub E for each equation E. Okay, and these will be non-negative, and we'll assume that they always sum up to one. Okay, so this is actually called weighted max three lin. Uh, of course, your task here is actually to now uh, not maximize the fraction of equations you satisfy, but maximize the total weights of equations that F satisfies. Okay, so the usual case is just if all of the weights are one over the total number of equations. This is a very slightly more general problem, but I actually assure you there's theorems that to this effect uh, Crescenzi, Silvestri, and Trevisan, that these problems are of equal algorithmic difficulty. Okay, so although it looks like a generalization, it's basically the same problem. Okay, so we're gonna actually prove hardness for weighted max three lint. Uh, questions so far? No? Okay, so, uh, great, so, we're not going to apply the methodology, so we're, our task is given. We have to construct a specific, like explicit instance of max three lin. So like just a big list of variables, or sorry, equations and weights now as well, um, which has all of these properties. Okay, so I will now tell you that instance. It was given by Hostad. So I'll call it the Hostad gadget. And uh, well, let's just go through them, G1 through G4. So G1 says that the variable set should be 0, 1 to the R, 
Well, it's more natural in this case to write it as z2 to the r. Okay, so the variables themselves are going to have names which we associate with uh, z2 to the r. I mean, uh, okay, so therefore an assignment, the assignments in this instance will be maps f uh, from z2 to the r into z2. Now, uh, okay, now I have to tell you the equations and the weights that I associate with them. Now, of course, uh, writing the weights as P sub E, I did it suggestively. These can also be thought of probabilities, right? They're supposed to be non-negative and they add up to one. In other words, a list of equations along with, you know, associated weights that are non-negative and add up to one is the same thing as a probability distribution on equations, right? So instead of giving you the list and like a weight for each one, I'm going to tell you a distribution D, a probability distribution on uh, equations. Okay, that will look like f of v i plus f of v j plus f of v k equals either zero or one. Okay, and here these v's will actually be lying in this set. Uh, and not only I'm not going to tell you, uh, you know, the list and the probability for each one, I'll just describe d as a random process that does some random things and outputs an equation. So that's how I'll describe d. Uh, so it's a bit long, but here it is. So this is what d does, and therefore this is what the, the instance is. So you will uh, choose. Uh, u and v from z2 to the r uniformly and independently at random. Okay. Uh, next, you will choose um, b from just z2, you know, uniformly. 0, 1 with probability 50% each. Uh, next, you'll choose lambda in z2 to the r. Uh, not uniformly. Instead, you'll actually choose it um, from a delta bias distribution. And what does that mean? It just means that for each coordinate, the probability that lambda i equals 1 is delta. Okay, so it's equal to 0 with probability 1 minus delta, and this is independent for all the coordinates. So lambda will tend to have about delta times r1s and 1 minus delta times r or so zeros. And uh, then you will define, well d will define w to be um, u plus v plus the vector b, 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 b plus lambda. And this is in, this is all in the group z2 to the r. And finally, D will output or generate the equation uh, f of u plus f of v plus f of w equals b. Okay. So that's the end of the definition of D and therefore the end of the definition of the gadget, which I remind you is a an instance of weighted max 3 lin mod 2. Is that clear? It's a bit complicated. Pierre? Lambda is here. Yeah. Okay, so U, V, W, underlying this. Yes. Uh, you, think, you think of this expression as a, an equation on f? Um, yeah, so you think of this expression somewhat symbolically. So u, v, and w, although they're sitting in z2 to the r, you think of them as just the names of, I mean, they're variables. They're names of variables. Uh, so they're 2 to the r variables, and you have an, a system of linear equations over 2 to the r variables, each involving three variables. Well, yeah, f is right here. Yes, it's a Boolean function. Uh, but the object is an instance of max 3 lin. 
Okay. Right, so it's a little cumbersome. This is, by the way, is the thing that some people have been calling a, um, a, a long code test or a dictator test. This is what these gadgets are also called. Uh, great. Uh, so let's make one more remark here. Um, so the Fs are the potential solutions. And uh, what is the quality of a solution F? It's the, well, before it was like the fraction of equations that it satisfies. Now it's the total weight of equations that are satisfied which is like the total probability mass of satisfied equations. In other words, to remark, um, the value of solution F is just the probability over D that F satisfies the equation. check G2 for a second because it's also easy and then I'll kind of reflect a little bit more on the, the test as a whole, but let's just formally check G2 for now. Okay. So G2 is that the optimum is C. Actually, I'll come back to that in a second, but I want to show you our optimal solutions which achieve the value. See, now we're shooting for C to be like one minus delta. I'm going to be not very careful about the difference between delta and a constant times delta. Uh, so. And it, it suggests here, G2, that these functions f, which are just depend on one coordinate, should be the optimal solutions and should have value one minus delta. So that's what we'll just check now. If f is like this, then its value is indeed one minus delta. And let's just formally check that. Well, the value of such a function f, if it just outputs the ith coordinate, it's such a projection function, is the probability that, well, from here we see that, uh, oops, it's the probability that ui plus vi plus wi equals b. Okay, and of course, um, wi here is equal to, by definition, it's going to equal um, ui plus vi plus lambda plus b, lambda i plus b. Right, this is wi, but everything is mod two, so this cancels, this cancels, this cancels, and so it's the probability that lambda i equals zero, which is by design one minus delta. Okay. So G2 is done. We have, uh, I'll show later that these are actually the optimal solutions. But we do have these OR coordinate solutions achieving this good value, one minus delta. So uh, skipping down to G4 for a second, uh, what we need to do is understand sort of the value of every solution F. So we kind of have to understand what, what is the meaning of this probability for a given solution F. Um, so, Quickly speaking, forget for a second about both lambda and b. Just pretend they're all zero, okay? Then what are we doing? You're choosing u and v. w is just u plus v. And you're checking that f of u plus f of v plus f of u plus v equals zero. So you're checking, everything again is mod two. So you're checking that f of u plus f of v equals f of u plus v. In other words, you're checking that f is a group homomorphism. Or if you think of z2 as F2, the field of two elements, you're checking that it's a linear map. So if you sort of forget about B and lambda, you would sort of tend to think that a linear function F passes this, I mean, has value, uh, satisfies this with probability one, in fact, and um, somehow functions that are not linear, or maybe far from linear, don't have a high probability of satisfying this check. Now, uh, there's actually B and there's actually lambda. Um, the B is a bit of a twist. Uh, actually, it just sort of enforces that not only is it a function, a linear function, or a, uh, well, I'll see, show later. Hmm. Okay, let me just end with that. That somehow, if you were to forget about B and lambda, you're sort of, this gadget is designed to give high values to the linear functions or the homomorphisms. 
Um, so based on that, it makes sense to, let me at least introduce some notation for these, these homomorphisms or linear functions or uh, characters really. So let me say for a subset S of the coordinates one through R, uh, let me define uh, chi sub S. This is a function from Z2 to the R into Z2, which is uh, chi S of X is the sum of xi for i in the set S. Okay, the sum is mod 2. Okay, so uh, I'll put this as an exercise. It's very easy, well, it's a nice exercise to check. That it's easy to give a formula for the, the value that a, a, a chi, a character, a linear function, um, passes this e uh, equation. So this is the formula. Uh, the value of the character or assignment at chi s is, it's uh, one half plus one half times one minus two delta to the cardinality of s if the cardinality of s is odd and it's one half if the cardinality of s is even. Okay, that's a nice little exercise to do. And, pardon me? Oh, no, no, this is the general So, it would come if it coincides with the previous line, s is one. Exactly, so I was, just what I was gonna say, this is a more general statement than this, let's just check. This is the case where the set S has cardinality one, which is odd, so we're in this formula case. And if cardinality of S is one, then you get, uh, well, you get one minus delta out of this. Okay. So to stare at this a bit more, let's see, if the function, suppose we knew the, suppose we were only considering F's which were chi's, which were homomorphisms or linear functions, then what's going on? Um, well, uh, if cardinality of S is like one or three or five or seven, then this is gonna be quite close to one, so overall the value will be quite close to one. <coughs> Indeed, it was very close to one if cardinality of S was uh, one. Or th um, if the cardinality of S is uh, zero, so it's a constant function, it's a half, and more importantly, what you see is if the cardinality of S is very large, then this factor will quickly go to zero. So if S is very large, then the value will be close to a half. Well, if this is even, it's, it's, also, it's always a half. Okay. So you can already kind of see what's going on with G3 and G4 here. If, let's say I just only considered F's which were um, these chi S's, these linear functions, then we kind of be in good shape, right? I mean, if you had a function that was a linear function, you could say that it suggests the coordinates that it depends on, unless that set is super constant, in which case, you know, if you have a, a, a linear function of, you know, a very large number of bits, let's say it's not clearly suggesting any coordinates, so we'll just say it doesn't suggest any. And then you would have the properties, right? Um, specifically, if you have a solution, uh, you know, if you have a chi s where s is either empty or very large, so that therefore it's not really pinpointing one or a small number of coordinates, then its value is close to a half, which is, exactly what we want. Our S that we're shooting for here is a half. Does that make sense? A little bit? Let's say this is the sum of two of them. So the lambdas would cancel, the UVs would cancel. Oh, you, are the lambdas units, are, are, are they exactly the same? Uh, I don't they independent Yeah, maybe, wait. Uh, each, each of the bits is independently one with probability delta, right? Yeah. So then. Uh, yeah, wait, maybe I'm making a mistake here. Because it should go down for every large enough Yeah. Uh, uh, so it should actually be one minus two delta to the S for every S. No. 
There's only one B remaining in this independent from the. Yeah, see, that's, yeah. The thing is, forget about the lambdas. Forget about the lambdas and everything. This will be some right hand side, but there'll be like one B that's. The B's get cancelled here. So you have one B left over. So whatever's going on here with the lambdas, it doesn't matter. B is like free and independent of that. So the probability that it equals that is a half. Okay, thanks. I was panicked there for a second. Perhaps max 3 lin wasn't hard to approximate after all. Uh, okay. Okay, so uh, now not every function f is one of these chi s's. So we're not sort of done in terms of verifying g3 and g4. Um, but we can sort of analyze the value of any f uh, using a discrete Fourier analysis. You see, now that these linear functions or these characters are involved, it suggests trying to understand functions in terms of their discrete Fourier transform. If you haven't seen it before, I'm afraid I'm not going to define it, so hopefully you'll get the gist of it. Um, the long and short of it is, um, here's a fact that you may know. Um, every function uh, f that maps z2 to the r into the real numbers, sorry for two different r's here, has a Fourier transform, a unique one. Okay, um, let me write g here for now. Uh, g of, yeah, g of x is the sum over all s, the subset of 1 through r, of g hat s times minus 1 to the character s at x. Okay, and these are real numbers. They're the Fourier coefficients of g. Uh, so it sort of decomposes any function into some sort of linear combination of characters. Uh, and now that it's more natural here to have functions whose range is r, although over here our assignments had range z2 to the n. So let's just uh, change some notation here. Let's have our assignments go now from not z2 to the r into z2, but let's have them map into r by replacing f with uh, minus 1 to the f. OK. Uh, OK. So now we're not going to use too much about Fourier transforms. Uh, the most basic fact we'll use, it's uh, called Parseval's identity. And the nice thing it says is if we have uh, an assignment, then the sum over all s of its Fourier coefficients squared is always 1. Okay. More generally, uh, Parseval says that it's equal to the average value of f of x squared. Well, you see our f's are, our f's are always plus or minus 1, so their square is always 1. Okay. And uh, how does this help us? Well, I'm afraid I'm going to leave it as an exercise again, but I'll do a more, well, I'll do a calculation of the same flavor later. You can express the value of any function f in terms of the Fourier coefficients quite nicely. It's, this, it's a half plus a half times the sum over all sets s of odd cardinality of 1 minus 2 delta to the cardinality of s times the Fourier coefficient of f at x cubed. Okay. And we can again check that this uh, is satisfied, I mean, this is in accordance with our fact about the value of a particular character. If f happens to just be a character, chi s, then all of its Fourier coefficients are zero, uh, except for, well, the one associated to that character, which will be one. So all of these summands will be uh, zero, except will be one minus two to the delta to the cardinality of s if s is odd. Otherwise, you'll have nothing in this. So uh, I'm afraid you'll have to take my word on it for this formula. But if there's anything I can say to explain what's going on. Pardon me? 
yeah, this is a calculation of, I don't know, five lines or something. Mm -hmm. So you, yeah, the probability, the value of f is this probability, probability that f satisfies this thing. So in this minus one, one notation, it's a half plus a half times the expected value of f of u, f of v, f of w, b, that's the products. Then you replace each f with its Fourier transformation and a bunch of simplifications happen when you do some calculations. Okay, so um, by the way, incidentally, from this formula, you can also easily show that the optimum f is one of these f of x equals xi's. That it's impossible for this value to be bigger than one minus delta. That requires this fact and also Parseval. Um, okay. Hmm, I'm running out of board space here. Okay, so let's look back at G3 and G4, which are now here. And now we should have to sort of really do them. So we need a scheme actually for taking a function f and naturally mapping it to sort of the, the coordinates one through r that it suggests. Okay, that somehow it depends on a lot in some way. And then we want to show that the value is small if this set is actually empty or if the function doesn't seem to be sp suggesting any one of the coordinates in particular. Uh, so I'll just tell you how we do it. Um, so now let me make a definition. Uh, I'm going to define a set of coordinates. Given f, I'll define a set of coordinates called suggestive f, which is hopefully suggestive of what we saw in the last talk. Um, so this will be all the coordinates i between 1 and r. such that something called the low degree, oh well, sorry, the noisy influence of coordinate i on f is at least delta, okay? Where this is some quantity, which I will now define. Uh, this quantity, the noisy influence, the one minus delta noisy influence of coordinate i on f it's defined in terms of the Fourier transform. It's the sum over all sets S, subsets of one through R, which contain I, of F hat S squared times a factor one minus delta to the cardinality of S. Okay, so that's a, uh, two big definitions to get your head around, so I'll move the boards and you can think about it. Okay, so the influence of, uh, the noisy influence of a coordinate i on f somehow measures how important the ith coordinate is to the function f. Um, you see it's less than or equal to the sum of the squares of all the Fourier coefficients, so it's less than or equal to one by Parseval, and it's positive, so it's a number between zero and one. Uh, if, this is an aside, but if you forget about this one minus delta to the s factor, so in other words, if you look at the, in this notation, influence just one of coordinate i on f, which is the sum over all s that contain i of f hat s squared. This has a very pleasant combinatorial interpretation as it turns out. This is equal to the probability that f of u is different from f of u, let me write superscript i, where here u is random uniformly, and u superscript i is u1 up to ui minus 1, 1 minus ui, and then the rest. In other words, it's, it has a combinatorial interpretation. You fix the function f, you pick a random input from z2 to the r, and you look at f's value there, then you just flip the ith coordinate of that input, look at f's value there, and see the probability that f's value changes. 
So it has, I mean, the name influence is kind of apt. It's, you know, the probability that flipping the i coordinate is relevant to f. Uh, so that's quite pleasant. Unfortunately, I have to introduce a slightly more complicated thing, this inf to the one minus delta. It has some kind of combinatorial interpretation, but not supernatural. So I'll leave it at that and say it's sort of related. Uh, okay. Um, so now I've defined the suggestion set f, and that's going to exactly be what's in this G3 here. Okay. So uh, what I need to do to prove G3 is show that indeed every function suggests only a constant number of coordinates. So again, I have to leave this as an exercise, but it's, this one's very easy. You would do it in uh, two minutes. Um, it's the basic fact that says for every f, the sum of all of the influ noisy influences is bounded. It's at most one over delta. Okay. In fact, it's at most one over e times delta. Okay. And now since the suggestion set is all of those coordinates i where this quantity is at least delta, we conclude therefore that the cardinality of this suggestion set is always at most one over delta squared times e even. Okay, so this is the big O of one in G3. So we've just got a system for taking any function f at all and sort of mapping it naturally into sort of the most important coordinates to it. And this set will always be of bounded size. It may well be empty, okay? Especially if somehow f suggests too many coordinates, then you sort of give up and none of them go into the set. Okay, so uh, we're making progress. Now we come to G4, which is sort of the actual main part of the proof. Which is not too hard after all this setup. Um, so what do you have to do in G4? So we'll put it as a proposition here. We have to check that if this suggestion set is empty, then the value is of the function is not much more than a half. So suppose the suggestion set of f is empty, which means all of these influences are small. Is less than delta for all i equals one to r. Then the value of f is at most a half plus one half times the square root of delta. I'll prove this proposition. Okay, does everybody see how though once we have this proposition, then we have essentially, we have G4. So if f is a function that doesn't suggest any coordinate in particular, then its value is actually basically a half, where half is our s here. Okay. Well, this is just the calculation essentially, but I'll do it. make this assumption about the influences and look at the value of f. And I'm going to upper bound it. So here's the formula I have right here. The value is this, half plus half sum over s odd, et cetera. Um, I'm going to look at this one minus two delta to the s times f hat s cubed as f hat s squared times one minus two delta to the s times f hat s. And I'm going to maximize over the, the second piece. So what I'm saying is that this is at most half plus one half, uh, well, let me write it. Okay, I'll do it more slowly. This is sum over S does not equal empty set, one minus two delta, cardinality of S, F hat S absolute value times F hat S squared. That's pretty clear. This is just exactly the same as that. I just added more terms. I just used the fact that S is odd to say that it's not empty. It's quite simple. So now I'll do what I said I was going to do. This is at most a half plus a half uh, times the max over S non-empty of this quantity, one minus two delta 
So the cardinality of s, f hat s in absolute value times the sum over s not empty, f hat s squared. That's fine because this is uh, non-negative, always. Now, this is certainly less than the sum of, I mean, you just add in the empty set, get the sum of all the squared Fourier coefficients, which is 1 by Parseval. So this is certainly at most 1 by Parseval. So I'll forget about it. Uh, now what will I do? Uh, I'll make a little observation here, which is that uh, 1 minus 2 delta to the cardinality of s, f hat, s, in absolute value is at most the square root of 1 minus delta to the cardinality of s, f hat s squared. Okay. Um, therefore, this is at most half plus a half times the square root of the max over s not equal to empty set of 1 minus delta to the cardinality of s f hat s squared. Okay, this is just some arithmetic. And finally, I claim that this is at most a half plus a half times the square root of the max overall i from between 1 and r of the influence, well, the noisy influence of i on f. Okay, and why is that? Well, imagine you have some set S, which is not empty, which is the maximizer of this thing that gives some value to 1 minus delta uh, cardinal of S, F hat S squared. Well, that S is going to show up in this sum here, in the definition of the influence, for every I that is contained in the S. And remember, this S is not empty. So it's going to show up in the definition for influence for at least one I. So for that I, this term will be included in this term. But finally, by assumption, all of these influences are at most delta. So this is at most half plus a half root delta. Okay. Any questions? Okay. So uh, we did it. We proved. Uh, hardness for three lin, that's optimal hardness, one minus delta versus a half plus delta, assuming the unique games conjecture, and Johan can also do it, assuming P does not equal NP. So I'll close by just doing one more example, which is the example of max cut, and I'll do even less of the proof, but we've set up some of the ideas now for the proof. Okay, so, uh, The theorem I want to do now concerns max cut. So, well, it actually concerns weighted max cut. So this is just the same as max cut, except the edges of the graph have weights, not negative weights, that sum up to one, just like in max three lin. You're trying to find a two coloring that uh, maximizes the weight of bichromatic edges. And the theorem here is that it's C versus this funny number, r cos 1 minus 2c over pi in approximable. Again, assuming UGC. And as with 3 lin, this is an optimal hardness result because there is an algorithm achieving um, r cos 1 minus 2c over pi on instances with value c. It's the Gomans Williamson algorithm from 94. Um, okay, so let's try to prove this theorem by, again, the same methodology. So just as the thing says up here, we need to construct a gadget instance of max cut, which has all these properties, okay? So it's a particular instance of weighted max cut. And just as with um, Hostad's uh, case, we'll think of that as a distribution uh, on edges. So what I mean by that is the following. Mm, let me say again that max cut is 
uh, so G, which is V comma E, edge weights summing to one. The output should be a two coloring. So let's think of it as a function F that maps the vertex set into minus one or one. And the goal is to uh, find an F which maximizes uh, the weight of cut edges, so of edges UV, which are cut, such that F of U differs from F of V. Okay. Okay, so now I'll define the gadget. Here's the gadget. It's due to Code Kindler, Mossel, and myself. So uh, again, you could think of it as, uh, sorry. Okay, so property G1 is that the vertex set V should again be 0, 1 to the R. Okay, so we'll again call it Z2 to the R. Okay, so our graph will have vertex set Z2 to the R. And our partitions will be maps from Z2 to the R into minus 1, 1 as before. And again, instead of telling you the edges and a weight for each edge, I'll tell you a probability distribution on edges. Okay. So the edge weights are going to be defined by a probability distribution D on edges which are pairs uv in z2 to the r squared. And here's the definition of d. It's actually quite similar to Hostad's gadget. Uh, so we're going to choose uh, u in z2 to the r uniformly as before. We're going to choose lambda in Z2 to the R, uh, not uniformly, but again from a biased distribution. So this will be uh, C-biased. In other words, the probability that lambda I equals C will be one, sorry, equals one will be C for all I. I should say here that C here is a parameter of the distribution. So we're actually proving many theorems, one for each number C. Um, so we're going to actually have many gadgets, one for each number C. So it's a parameter of the, the gadget. Okay. So actually, as before, before lambda only had a very small number of ones. But actually here you should think of C as a number like maybe 0.9. So actually this lambda will have many ones. 0.9 of them would be one. Uh, okay. So next we'll just let V be U plus lambda, which is in Z2 to the R. And we'll finally generate the edge uh, UV. Okay. So this is a weighted graph whose uh, vertices are the vertices of the hypercube. And basically two edges are connected uh, with a weight that's proportional to uh, the probability that you would go from one to the other if you applied some kind of uh, C noise to each coordinate. In fact, this is the, exactly the noisy hypercube graph that Sanjeev talked about in his talk earlier. Um, okay. And so as a remark, if we have any cuts F, the value or the, the total weight of edges that F cuts is again, it's just the probability under this distribution D that F of U differs from f of v. So if f is a cut, this is its value in this max cut problem. Any questions? 
So this D. Random graph. Uh, no, not a random graph. This D defines one fixed weighted graph. Uh, it's a graph whose vertex set is Z to the R. And instead of telling you the weights explicitly of each edge, I told you how to choose an edge yeah, with that weight. Okay. So in fact, I mean, you could even say the, the, I guess the weight on edge UV would be something like, I'll get this wrong if I do it now, but maybe like C to the Hamming distance of U of V times one minus C to R minus the Hamming distance or some formula like this perhaps altered slightly. Okay, good. Um, well, let's check G2 again. That's the easy one usually and it's always by design. So if F is the two coloring or cut or partition, Uh, F of a vertex U is UI. So you're cutting the cube along one of the coordinate hyperplanes. Um, then what is the value of F? Well, it's the probability that UI differs from VI. It's the probability that, well, that lambda I equals one, which is C. Yeah. Um, good, so that doesn't actually say that it's optimal, but again, just now we'll see that it is optimal. So we have, again, our different coordinate solutions are each achieving value C, which is what we want. Uh, so now we have to think about G3 and G4. Um, well, again, it's an easy Fourier exercise that the value of any old function F can be written, again, in terms of the Fourier coefficients. The formula looks pretty similar. It's a half plus one half sum over all subsets S of one through R of, uh, well, there's F hat S squared now. There's two C minus one to the cardinality of S and there's minus one to the cardinality of S plus one. So it's a bit similar to before. This is some number of C is gonna be like, again, 0.9, so maybe this is 0.8. So it's some geometrically decaying factor involving the cardinality of S. This minus one is not too important. Uh, again, it just sort of punishes the function F for emphasizing even sets and rewards them for having odd sets. In particular, it punishes the empty set. Now you have an F hat S squared here, and it turns out that makes analyzing this expression quite difficult because you can't do this trick that we did somewhere, I guess to race now, of taking out one factor of F hat of S to sort of measure the importance of that and then using Parseval to bound the rest. You can't borrow any factors here to use Parseval. So you look kind of stuck. It's somewhat hard to analyze. Um, the the good, so let's take a bit of a pause. What we're really trying to show here is uh, G3 and G4, so that if you have any old solution at all, F, you want to understand its value, its quality as a cut. No, just use the formula. Ah, this is for all functions f. For all f. So this is a vertex set. Therefore, f represents a, part a two coloring of it. And this represents the total weight of edges which it makes bichromatic. Uh, well, uh, they're all in there. I mean, there's a, there's a positive weight for every edge. Mm -hmm. So this is the general, sorry. Yeah, this is the general F. Yeah, okay, good, thank you. Um, okay, um, good. So G3 tells us that again, we need a scheme for associating to each any old cut at all, F, any two coloring, a set of coordinates, and we'll use the same scheme as before. Okay, so we're again defining suggestion set of F to be the set of all coordinates I such that the influence uh, sub I of some one minus delta noise of F is at least delta. 
So it's the same scheme for mapping a function f to its important coordinates. And just as before, I mean, it's the same definition. So I'll just remind you that this suggestion set is always of bounded cardinality. Even times an e. So it comes down to G4. We want to show, so what we need is the following theorem, well, the following fact. Well, what we need to do is understand the following. If the suggestion set is empty, then we want that the value of f is small. Well, what are we going to say? Let's think about this, this uh, hypothesis for a second. The suggestion set being empty is kind of like saying f is not too aligned with any of these r coordinate cuts. It somehow doesn't depend much on any one coordinate. And if you reflect on this for a bit, you come to the idea, or the intuition that was in this paper of KKMO, But somehow, the best such f that has an empty suggestion set is the majority function, which is uh, f of x is minus 1 to the majority of the coordinates of x. Um, so that's a function that doesn't really depend particularly on any one coordinate. And you can compute its value. It's sort of the cut of this cube that's orthogonal to the main diagonal. And uh, it's not a hard calculation. It's actually done by a guy called Guilbeau in 52. And it's that the value of this for big R is this magic number, R cos. 1 minus 2 delta over pi. C, thank you. Um, so this was the idea. In fact, uh, KKO conjectured that um, the answer here is this number plus little o of delta. And that's uh, what's proved subsequently by Mossel, O'Donnell, that's me, I guess, and Oleskovich in 05. And it was called majority is stabilist by KKMO. Uh, and it's, well, it's just this. So if f is a minus one, one function on the RRA cube, and all of these influences are small. Which is to say that the suggestion set is empty. Yeah, for all i. Then the value of this function f, i.e. the probability that f of u differs from f of v when they're chosen in this way, is indeed at most star cos. 1 minus 2 c over pi plus little of 1. Okay, and I don't have quite enough time to prove that. I'll just say that it uh, uses two ideas. The first idea is to take this condition that says no particular coordinate is very important for f and somehow use uh, a central limit type result to convert the problem to a function, uh, to a problem about, from a problem on uh, the hypercube to a functions on Gaussian space. And then once you sort of converted the problem to an equivalent problem on Gaussian space, uh, this fact follows from a certain um, isoparametric inequality due to Christer Borel from 85. So it takes a bit of work to prove this, but uh, once you do, you can, you've, exhibited this gadget which has all the appropriate properties and you conclude the hardness of the max cut problem. Okay, I'll stop here. Thanks. <laughs> Any questions? So the, the unconditional in approximately, in approximately result of Pascal, 
space and the same gadget? Um, no, but that is a good point. Uh, especially if you're not a believer in the unique games conjecture, you would ask, well, what's the best in approximability one can prove for max cut anyway? And that's also due to Hostad uh, borrowing also some ideas of Trevisan, Sudan, Sorkin, Williamson. And he proved that result by making a gadget reduction from the three limb result we did in the first half of the course, or the talk, to max cut. So he, uh, it was a gadget reduction like that. And it achieves something uh, not quite as good. It achieves one minus epsilon comma one minus five fourths epsilon uh, in approximability for all epsilon less than something, a quarter. Some, some explicit number here. It's not a quarter, but. Um, so it's a bit different because uh, with this uh, C versus arc plus C, it's more like one minus root epsilon. And the fact that this, this is a constant, whereas you know, this is a super constant uh, quantity times epsilon is somehow related to the, the super constant in approximability of sparsest cut that Sanjeev talked about. Other questions? Exactly. How does it compare exactly? I mean, how, how is the, mm -hmm. is it, how sharp is the, the It's quite sharp. So, uh, um, it's actually arc cos is continuous, so uh, you can actually phrase this as for all c less than one. I can just push this minus delta to out here. Um, and conversely, Gomez and Williamson show that uh, there exists an SDP algorithm such that for all C actually bigger than some number, uh, it's C comma arc cos one minus two C over pi approximates max cut. So in fact, uh, it's completely sharp um, because you can make this any delta arbitrarily small. Uh, it's completely sharp for C bigger than 0.845. And actually a completely sharp result for all C is, is known on both sides. Thanks. Thanks.